Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So, hello, everybody. So, let me be the first to welcome you at yet another Brucon. It's our seventh edition, so we're really happy to be here. It actually has been a very difficult year for us because we had like three core members who decided to take a step back. So we suddenly realized how much work they actually did and actually how much work one person individually actually took. And we suddenly had to fill in the gap and man, it was difficult. We also had a lot of cancellations and people being sick, speakers and all that. And well, these are things that happen, right? But yeah, we'll have to figure it out. But actually on the positive side, we actually have like, I guess like our biggest crowd ever. So most people ever. We have like very good trainings. We have an extensive amount of workshops. And we have something very exclusive. I mean, we've been like in the first time in many years, we are able to get like the, again, still the best beer in the world, West Vleteren. We've actually been, been able to get quite some cases over here, so I do encourage you guys to give it a try. It's lovely. So, as I said, in general, it's still on the positive side. We're happy to be here again. We're happy to see how many people actually turned up. So, have fun in these two days. So, like Tom said, we have this year more than 500 people attending Brucon. Uh, first of all, a couple of rules. This room, uh, for those who have been here the last years, has been completely refurbished. We have new seats, everything. So that means that last year's rule was no food, no drinks in the room. This year it's been enforced even more. Uh, other one, we have a couple of new things this year. This is the first year that we have an ICS village. Uh, it is organized in the other room, West Mall. You can play around with ICS stuff, uh, break some things. I encourage you to go and see what happens there. Um, other points, we have awesome retro here. If you are a fan of arcade games and really old games of the 80s and 90s, uh, we have a room with some of those games. It's upstairs on the balcony. Um, another point I wanted to add is about the workshops. Uh, we didn't expect to have so much success with the workshops organization and people figured out they can register online as was indicated on the website but we forgot to put a cap on the number of registrations, which means that we have so many overbookings. Um, we have tried to remediate a bit and we organized a couple of more workshops. Uh, we created another room, so we created next to the Westmal, Orval, uh, West Fleteren, uh, and La Trappe, we have the Chime, and we have a new room, Rochefort, as well. So, we have additional trainings, they are still not on the schedule. We will release those after this short presentation and you will be able to register for those. We will have an extra workshop of I am the Cavalry, today between 2 and 4. We will have another workshop on Colonel Tales and uh, RM exploitations between 2 and 4 as well. We have another workshop of Software Defined Radios and another workshop of Malware Triage tomorrow afternoon. Maybe we'll fit one extra, uh, but this will be announced later on. Um, another point, our speaker of tomorrow, Richard Thiem, uh, will not be able to fly to Belgium to give his presentation, but we will try to accommodate him with a Skype session. We will do some tests. We hope it will be working well, but if it doesn't, we will find another solution for you. Um, also, all talks will be recorded, will be available live from the internet. This means that there will be video shooting as well and at some points we will try to make a shooting of the room. So if you don't want to be filmed, we will announce it up front and we give you enough time to leave the room before we take the shots. Um, I think that's more or less about it regarding the Brucon organization. Next to that, I will announce our next speaker. He has been a pen tester for more than 15 years, has encountered many situations. Uh, he is an expert in red team testing, in real world uh, attacks. Um, he's pretty known in the InfoSec industry. It's Chris Nickerson, he's right here, and he's, gi he's giving a presentation on nightmares of his pen testing career. Welcome, Chris. All right. We'll try and this place is so gorgeous. 
It's really amazing. I love it. All right, before we get started on anything, this is, this is the security conference that when I started traveling a lot um, made me fall totally in love with going to other cities to go talk about security. Because when I was young, I really, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed seeing other people's perspective, but I was so windowed to being in like places of the US that I could sneak on a train and travel to because my parents sure as hell weren't gonna let me at 16 go to Vegas. Um, so I had to find my way there. And, and I found my way to a bunch of security conferences and, and it was fun and it was interesting and, and I got to meet a lot of the community there. But when I came over here, it was totally different. I, I felt this really awesome connection to a community that I felt like I lost in the States in a lot of regard. Um, there was just, there's people that had already become sick of it. There was people that weren't doing the same level of innovation. And, and I came here and I was so invigorated by just the amount of talent and the amount of cool things that everybody was doing and the mixture of people from all over the place that it just, it, it made me insanely happy. I remember the, the first BrewCon that I went to, um, I was sitting there and it was this, I mean, it felt like I was at some crazy, you know, TED Talk RSA thing. There was like screens everywhere and like cool hip lighting and like random rave music. And I was like, this is, this is the neatest thing I've like ever done. And after I watched the first two talks, which I'm sure if any of you were, were there, I, I sat up in this little speaker room and I was like sitting on the edge watching the talks and I'm like, damn it, like, my talk sucks. <laughs> I'm like, it really sucks. And like now that all these other people are giving really good talks, like I'm screwed. I, I should just delete everything and give another talk. So I deleted it all and I sat up there for the rest of the first day watching talks and trying to build another talk that didn't suck as much as the first one that I made. Um, I'm not real sure how it turned out, but I felt like it was a little bit better. And, and the stuff that you guys do has always inspired me to do better and be better. So I want to thank, before I say anything, the BrewCon team, the staff here, everything that you guys do, and all of you who are sitting around for at least, if, if I can thank you for anything, for making me force myself to get better and force myself to learn and force myself to know that I really don't know a damn thing about this industry, even if though I've been in it for a really long time. So thank you guys, really. Um, all right, so I'm Chris, um, whether it's a pirate or business or random, you know, communist manifesto, Chris, I have disclaimers, uh, part of my disclaimers are things like I'm annoying and I'm loud. Um, I figure this is easier for people who get really sensitive about things. And since I get to open it up now, it sets a really low bar to entry for everybody else. So if one of you says fuck by accident, oh, ah, um, that's cool, I already did it, you can blame me. Um, I'm, I'm here to break down walls for people. <laughs> All right, uh, that's me. If you wanna get a hold of me in any way or spam me or troll me or whatever else, that's cool, I don't mind. Um, that's the places that I've worked in the world and I've worked kind of all over the world and done a bunch of stuff in security. That's the like, I'm legitimate, really, listen to me, I should talk about stuff and I really know what I'm doing, but no one really knows what they're doing. So I'm, uh, I, I own a company called Lars uh, with my partner Eric Smith and, and some people that make me feel like an idiot every day, which I appreciate. Uh, we do stuff like code review um, and you know, app testing, we do some incident response work. Um, we do risk assessments. Uh, you know, we do physical security. Uh, we do forensics. Uh, uh, you know, we, we do different types of adversarial modeling and attack, or just watch screens that look really pretty, like Norse in the background, um, just because it looks cool on TV. Uh, we do pen testing, which I don't, if, you, if any of you guys have never seen this picture, it's so awesome. It's, it's the picture I hand to most of our clients when they ask us for a pen test. And they're like, we were being serious. And I was like, yeah, kind of. 
maybe you should like read this and tell me at what level do you want the pen test to happen. Um, <laughs> I love the rich kid. <laughs> they just, I have a whole bunch of tools. Look, it works. Click, click, click. Uh, we do red teaming work, and we do a bunch of custom other weird stuff. Uh, whether it's adversarial modeling in ways, whether it's profiling adversaries and attacking the way that we do. There's, I mean, we have pen tests that last like two to five years long where we're just looking for a specific objective or trying to get into a point where we're in their manufacturing process in order to make a part and trying to compromise that particular part so that we can show that, I don't know, uh, a weapon system, maybe when it gets delivered 10 years from now, has a specific vulnerability that I know exists because I put it in 10 years earlier. And then we can walk up in the field and one of the things about the shoot, have like the little magic clicky button and be like, nope, no shoot today. Um, because that sucks for them. Like that's a real risk. That's a really big problem if somebody can do that. Not just like, oh, I got a shell in your box, ha ha ha. All right, um, there's, yep, there's my PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm glad that I just get to offend people right off the bat. It's good. Okay, so the, the generic stats of the world. Have you guys read the Verizon DBIR and stuff like that before? It's a really great, rich information source to scare the shit out of people in order to give them the ability to give you money to do your job. It also talks about all the different type of attacks and stuff that have been going on. <clears throat> so every time I look at this, I get like the sad panda face because we're just like the crappiest stock investors on earth. We just put more and more money every year in. We lose more every year, right? We, we know what the motives are of all of these people. We have conferences where we're like, this is what you need to do to stop the attacks. And then next year, these numbers are gonna just all be more. Um, some of the things that I found interesting in this year's is that over 70% of the attacks there was a secondary victim, and most of the time that means someone got owned so that they could own somebody else. Which to me, in my world of you know, why you should do this type of testing, or what you should do, or where you should do testing, or, or whether it's in the development life cycle, or whether it's actual adversarial work, or whether it's just you know, modeling something in your SDLC to make it harder in the code base, the, the excuse of nobody's going to come after us is ridiculous because they're going to come after you to get access to your partners. And that's one of those things that most people don't really fully grasp is that you're not always going to be the target. You might just be the easy way into somebody else. This little graph is beautiful. It shows that the time to compromise versus the time to discover. Right? And these are for, on average, people are using exploits that are more than a year old. You know, so our, our bar to entry of compromising an organization is, well, we know that we're not going to patch stuff that's like, I don't know, a year old. So anything within the last year, we're most likely vulnerable to. But the, the funnier part of this is, like, not even 25% of the attacks from 2004 to 2014 were even identified that they happened. Like, more or less the, the idea that we stopped them, right? This is just figuring out that it, they actually got attacked. So I, I have to pose the question to most people that when everybody says we're, we're getting worse, the attacks are going up, things are breaking more, we're not as good, I, I think it's just a visibility thing. I think we're sucking just as hard as we used to, <laughs> but we now have a couple more tools in the environment to be like, oh, hey, we got owned. And, and you know, that's cool if we do something with that. All right, common denominators, obviously, you know, points of sale because they have money. Crimeware because it makes money. Cyber espionage because it makes somebody money. Privilege misuse because having privileges is really cool. <laughs> Web applications because they hold all the stuff that gets you to the stuff that gets you the money. You know, miscellaneous errors, because somebody messed up, maybe because they didn't get enough money. <laughs> you know, loss in stolen assets, because there's pawn shops and you can sell it and get money. Payment cards, because, you know, hey, that's a little piece of plastic with money on it. Um, there's a pretty easy theme with all of these. So we have this awesome security 
kind of idea, right? And, and, we, and we try to do things to defend ourselves. So we buy all this stuff. We buy a bunch of stuff to put in line. And then we test all of our stuff. Well, some of us test all of our stuff. Some of us test some, some of us don't do any testing and just have faith. Um, wow, sorry, that just brought me on a tangent in my mind of like, hmm, I wonder how security is like religion. Um, boy, that could be a bad topic. Yep, some other day. So, you know, we test our stuff because we bought it, we want to see if it works, right? Okay, but we still get owned all the time. We play the grass is greener game of like, oh, well, if I had this product, it would have stopped it. So we go back to buying things, and then you buy that thing, and then somebody gets around it, and they're like, but if you had the new NG2000 version with the added APT9 you know, defense and behavioral blah, blah, you know, you just make words up, and people are like, yeah, I gotta buy that shit. It's like Apple, right? Like you just make something new and you have to buy it even though it does nothing, because you're just like, I don't care, it's new, I have to have it. Um, but that's what we do in security, right? We just like fall out in this marketing game and we buy a bunch of stuff. And it's no fault to the people that are buying stuff. Like they're actually doing their job. They're doing as best as they can going, I'm not a pen tester. I don't know what these things are, but these people said that it blocks that thing and I'm giving them a million dollars so they probably do their job, right? And other people like Gartner, I mean, they paid them a million dollars to put them in the right quadrant, so they obviously are doing the right thing. I mean, or whatever that is, or Poneman, to like fake the statistics. Um, but I figured the best I can do to try and help this whole battle is to give you the idea of what happens when we're doing pen testing and someone pisses us off and makes it hard for us. Because if they're making it hard for us, even if we suck, even if I'm like, the most retarded kid who comes in last in the Special Olympics, it, at, least, at least I get something. And, and I just need to be able to give something back opposed to just buy a new thing or put a new widget in, right? So I wanna try and share where it hurts for us and where it's hard for us to operate and what people have done, whether it's creative or utilitarian or whatever else, to make it difficult when we do testing. So the idea is, if there's a monster on your bed, scare the shit out of it. Like, beat it up. And if you have a pen tester who's pen testing your environment, interact with them as fully as you can. The idea of these like whitelisted pen tests or, or testing in an open fashion where, where we tell you when to stop or when not to stop, that needs to go away. That's, that's like making us the most inept fighters in the world. You know, ooh, you punch me in the face. No, 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 not in the face. Not, I want to spar with you, just don't punch me in the face. Like, that, we can't do that. If you're going to do it that way, just don't do it. Because you're going to lull yourself into thinking that you have game and you have none. Right? All right. The paradigm of this is that good security programs are built in and not bolt on. If you feel like your security program needs to have a thing in it, in order to stop a main avenue of attack, you need to re-architect your security program. The security program needs to be built in already to know, hey, we can stop this, or hey, we can identify this in some way, shape, or form, and that whatever tool we're putting in is gonna augment the speed that we have, the mean time to eradication, or it's going to increase the visibility that we have, give us more accuracy in the environment, something that is a capability maturity model that is above zero or one. So we're not to the ad hoc point. We're not just relying on our automated tools. We're using them for our benefit. Does that sound crazy? No, maybe. It's early, it's early. All right. So we'll break down some of them. External defenses, right? Number one, don't talk to strangers. Totally easy. Just don't talk to them. You know, it, it, how many of you automatically block everything from the emerging threats list? Why don't you block that? Any, any, I mean, is there any reason? Like it's internet known bad guys. If you had like, no neighborhood criminals, would you just let them come kick it at your house? You know for sure that these people are criminals and bad guys. Would you just be like, oh, come on in, have some coffee. 
So, so these types of things, right, that automatically gives you past step one. You're gonna block 90% of all of the bad stuff that's happening by other people who've been doing great research to figure out who the bad guys on the internet are. Yes, every once in a while you're gonna find a site that is hosting malware and it's really you know, some customer site, but you can deal with those in a one-off fashion. For the bulk of it, block things in the emerging threats list and you're gonna be doing a lot to cut down traffic and you're gonna save bandwidth, right? Having some type of honeypot the traffic was sent to, it's good. I mean, I don't really want people to go out and put a whole bunch of honeypots out there and then say, yeah, we're doing security because we have people attacking us successfully in our honeypot because you have to be staffed to do that. But if you have enough staff and you have some ability to analyze what's going on with the honeypot, then you can put it up and you can use it to start t tuning your defensive rules, okay? Port scanning bans. How many people do that? So like somebody port scan you and then all of a sudden it goes, ha ha, you're banned, I'm sorry, you port scan me. No legitimate traffic needs to port scan me. And then everybody goes, but what about our VoIP boxes? And then you're like, fix them, right? Again, really, really easy thing. Port scanning bans alone will stop a good 90 to 95% of your point and click pen testers that are out there. They'll be like, I don't know, I couldn't get anything, you need to whitelist me. And then be like, no, do your job or don't suck. <laughs> it's not that hard to figure out how to do it. And if you can't prove to me that an attacker could do it and you're like, well, if I had six months and I could port scan one port a week, okay, cool, you got six months, go. And then they're like, damn it, I don't know what to do. Make your pen testers cry. Like make them submit. Make, like I want, I want your debrief meetings to be like, tell me again why I should pay you because it looks like you didn't do anything. That would be great, wouldn't it? Put clauses in the contract to be like, if you get nowhere, if you can't show me anything, you provided me no value. They probably won't sign the contract. And then you'll be able to at least find somebody who's a decent pen tester because they'll be like, I'll give you something. I don't even care. I know I can get something. Right? Those are the people that you want. They're not going to attack. You think the attackers are going to stop? They're going to be like, oh, I couldn't port scan it. So we decided to just say, forget it. We'll move on, move on to somebody else. All right. Testing and making sure blocking actually works. You know how many firewalls just don't actually block traffic? I mean, when, what, two years ago when they did the TCP midstream renegotiation stuff, out of all of the top 10 firewalls, only one of them could actually stop it from working? I mean, it's in the RFC, you're supposed to be able to midstream renegotiate. Oh, but it was already in the state table, yeah. And then you just randomly let another port through? Yeah, it told me to, that's not cool. Like, that's not good. We don't want our stuff to do that. It needs to be really static, all right? Doing big data and threat intel, there's a lot of awesome research going on in this community right now about how to demystify and debunk the bullshit big data threat analytics game. And I want so much more of that to happen because that game is making a ton of vendors out there, and I'm, maybe I'll mention them later that they're full of shit, but they are, <laughs> and you could do all of this stuff yourself. I mean, you know, there's, there's Open IOC, there's Taxi, there's all these really awesome, rich repositories of stuff where you could do all of this data analysis and start correlating some of these things and stand up your own elk cluster and, and stack and just dump all of this information into it and dump your traffic logs into it and wait for the big giant red boxes to rain from the sky and be like, oh look, the bad things are here. You know, we don't have to do it at a super fancy level. Protect all of your OSINT. All right, so here's some places that you guys can go if you haven't done any of these things, right? And I'm, we'll put all these slides up where you can get to start doing them. You can start using some honeypots. You know, Drupal and WordPress honeypots I love because if you have Drupal or WordPress, guess what? Somebody already owned it. Um, and you just haven't found it yet. <laughs> Uh, if you're going to monitor stuff that's open, you know, stuff like filibuster or firebind or something like that, test. 
put little nodes all over your network and test to make sure I can get from this part to this part, this part to this part, inside to outside, outside to inside, DMZ to wherever else, whatever classified zone that you have to some other zone, and keep constant monitoring of what's open. If magically one day a new port opens up and it's not tied to some change request that you have, freak out, shut the whole environment down. I mean, totally go bananas. I mean, walk over and punch the network engineer in the face who set the change in. I, I mean, it'll stop stuff. Fire them on the spot. You'd be amazed at how effective some of those techniques are. <laughs> All right. Um, emerging threats, again, just block everything on the list. It's legit. It gets updated often. It's really, really easy way to lower the overhead that's going into the environment. And then check things, check your surface landscape. Check what's going on, what's being leaked. The Spiderfoot project is really awesome. Anybody heard of that or played with that? Super cool. I mean, literally, you can type in your domain name, hit go, and it does a billion different checks of the types of things that we do when we're profiling a customer to try and figure out what do we have to attack. Phishing. Uh, phishing should be really easy to defend against. And everybody who wants to complain that the users are our biggest problem and they're always gonna click on stuff and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, no shit, they're always gonna click on stuff. It's your job to protect that. So if you're the person telling me that the user clicked and that's what destroyed your whole security program, you suck, build a better program. It's really easy. Just don't, don't blame somebody else. It's your fault. All right. Disabling SMTP Verify, easy, one click if you're in Microsoft, you know, one, well, half of two commands if you're on a Linux box. Use SPF records, always. Make sure that all of your mail filtering solutions are encrypting all of the protocol types and decrypting all of the protocol types. Yes, you have to be able to do some man in the middle analysis. And yes, I know that there's European laws that says you can and can't do this, but you can still take metadata analysis out of that. Right, site classification, super, super good. If I have a new site that just got stood up, right, it should be very easy for us to analyze how long that site's been online. And I can say, without a shadow of a doubt, that magically tomorrow, you're probably, if you're some type of larger organization, you're probably not the first person to go to that website. It's been around longer than you. I mean, I know you're the hipster of the internet that knows where all the cool new shit is, but it's probably been around a little bit longer than a couple days. So as far as that's concerned, monitor your traffic and don't let people go to sites that haven't marinated on the internet long enough. It, they could be legit, that's fine. Make them wait another week. Wait until they get classified. And that's not to say that we don't try and beat classification because we have a script that submits our fish site to every single one of the entities that are out there and says, hey, look, we're really a flower site or hey, we're this classification versus this classification because when we do our OSINT profiling, we know what sites they can get to because we can see, oh, hey, they're posting from this tech forum and they did it last month. And oh yeah, it doesn't matter that they just drop registry keys and you know the format of how everything works in their environment, but you know that they're definitely posting from work. So if you classify appropriately, we can start limiting what the C2 hits, right? So that certificate age, that's what we talked about a little bit. Use DNS analysis, figure out who's going where. You know, there's lots of open source projects for that. There's free projects for that. There's, you know, the, the, the different open DNS and stuff like that, that that will actually actively look for things in DNS within how long the site's been there, whether the cert's valid or not. You know, these are things, again, that are really, really easy to stop attackers. There are very few attackers that I see that are out in the wild that marinate their domains for long enough, that actually have the right certificates, that have signed it, their SPF records and everything are in order, and the mail is supposed to get to you. So these are, these are really basic types of stops that we can use. You know, ver verifying just the sender identity alone to make sure that the address and the MX records are correct, most of the time they'll just screw that up because they're like, well, you're not gonna email me back, so I'll just send the fish. No reason to set up another record, right? Because attackers are lazy. I mean, pen testers are lazy. Um, all right, ways to do that stuff, again, pretty easy. You can block the spam house and spam cop list. 
right? Another way to actively and proactively block these things, these guys monitor it, they vet the results. It's very, very good data. If you're actively syncing your environment and blocking these types of things at your mailer, you don't have to worry about all of that crap coming in. You're gonna cut down the noise. And the more we cut down the noise, the more time we have to spend on the things that are really important. All right, so when people do all this stuff to us and we're doing a fish, we have to work our ass off. And we have to set up a whole environment, we have to set up a cert, we have to sign the cert, we have to go through you know, the faking the code authorities, we have to be able to you know, let the cert marinate for a certain amount of time, we have to be able to classify it into all of these sites. And this is before we even try and get to the point of like, you know, you can has $100 million if you click on link. And then it's a page of like, give me your NT username and password so I could give you a million dollars. And they're like, okay. And they're gonna do that anyway. And we could train our users what bad stuff looks like. We can use all of the different fun tools. I mean, Kennedy's here, you can use set, you can use all sorts of stuff to actively train them to say this is what bad looks like and increase their knowledge over time so that instead of becoming the first thing that pisses you off, they're the first line of defense that you have. And once you start treating your users like the first line of defense, it's a big, big, big change in the environment. Right? You empower them to run out to click on anything that they want in the world, and you go, you know what? Our internal game is so strong, and what we do is so strong that I want you to click on stuff. I want to have, instead of hack days, I want you to have get hacked days. Go out, find an enterprise machine, put everybody in the room, go, go to the internet, and click on as much random bad shit as you can, fan, you can find and sit it in a private network and then let your security team come in and be like, cool, how do you deal with this person's box? Like, look at the 500 toolbars that they have installed. How do we make sure that that doesn't happen again? Knowing that they're gonna do that, show me a proactive way that this will not happen. I don't care about what you can break into, I wanna see what users could do when you give them the opportunity to do the worst shit they ever could think of. And then start building your defenses. All right, internal defense. Monitor inside versus outside. Why, why? Why, why, would you, why would you spend so much monitoring the inside and nothing monitoring the outside? Or uh, whatever, vice versa. You know, wh why would you ever sit there and go, well, we need to have all this IDS on the outside so we can get a ton of noise from the people that are scanning us all the time, just so that we can promptly ignore it and tell our auditors, yeah, we've got IDS. It's on the outside, and then the auditor goes, okay, IDS, check. You know, like, it did, you did nothing. Like, wouldn't you want all of those signatures and all of those things tuned to the inside of your environment to be like, hey, if I have an alert that goes off and it's on the inside of the network, we probably need to not ignore it. You know, if you're ignoring your alerts, then you're just alerting wrong. You just need to tune stuff. All right, segmentation, everybody knows about, yeah? We all tell each other, segment everything, it's, even though it's really, really hard to do. Blocking port scans on the inside? This is another one. Like, how many people block an alert for port scans on the inside? Like, four people? That's weird. What machines need to port scan on the inside of your network? Other than none. Or mainframes. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, I need to open. 34,000 ports for no reason. Um, it's a message queue. So, but you can filter that stuff out and make it really relevant, right? Looking at net flows, looking at analysis, looking at top talkers on the network. Trust me, if somebody is talking to an outside entity and it's over, you know, a couple gig, you probably have a problem. You know, it's not just somebody who's, who's just magically allowing things to go out. You know, they're doing their job by exfilling gigs of data from the company. They're probably not real. Um, and most of those really monitor the access to all of the different cloud services that are out there. So, you know, whether they're going to Azure or whether they're going to, you know, Blue or whether they're going to any of the Amazon or every other cloud service that's out there, monitor what's there, get an understanding of what different types of cloud services you're allowed to use in the environment, and if something goes out to one of those other cloud services, investigate it and shut it the fuck down. Turn it off. 
oh, but I was using Azure to model this thing. Great, you're out of process, sorry, it's gone. Oh, but I needed to get to Dropbox and you know, AWS was really great because they host all of Dropbox's data. Um, just turn all that stuff off. Make sure that you can monitor it. And if you don't have tools to monitor it, use the tools to try and get visibility into that instead of the next generation, whatever cool firewall that's gonna block the one bullshit attack that they used in the demo when they were sitting on the floor that made you go, ooh, you block stuff. Um, blocking down configs, again, not a hard thing to understand. But these are the types of suggestions we should be working on, right? Not, not the, oh, stop the whole attack chain. Let's take this one piece at a time and start breaking down what we need to do. Obviously, anything else? One of the hardest things that I've ever encountered on a test was a client that had no default route. So hardcore. That was like the most hardcore thing. You plug into a network, you get no default route. What's up? <laughs> like, go for it. <laughs> like, they had NAC and no default route. Like, ready? Sit in a conference room, tell me what you could do. Watching the amount of tears and confusion from like the, the point and click pen tester people who are sitting in that room and they're just like, mm hmm no network, but it's blinking. And they're like, but maybe it, maybe it doesn't work. I don't know, somebody, that dude plugged his computer in and it works. And they're like, but maybe, maybe my computer's broken. <laughs> and you're like, okay, how about plug it into this? Did you get an address? Yes. Okay, plug it into this one. Do you get it? No. What happened? I don't know. I don't want, I want to go home. <laughs> I, I don't, mm -mm. I looked in Metasploit and typed search and can't get any address and it just gave me the finger. <laughs> and I don't want to be here. <laughs> like, that, it's so beautiful. Now granted, doing something like that takes an insane amount of work. But if you could start building environments, when you're building new environments and thinking about being able to statically route things and removing all default routing from the environment, Imagine how easy it would be to tune the IDS and tune any of your traffic analysis tools, right? Oh, something has some type of gratuitous ARP asking where a certain address is, eh, attacker. <laughs> Rogue host that's not set up right. There's no more broadcast traffic for anything. <laughs> like, it's amazing. Their network ran super clean. It was the fastest 100 megabit network I had ever been on because there was nothing in the way. It was really cool. And attacking those types of things, especially when like you send a fish and you're looking at the box and you're trying to find other things in the environment and they're like, yeah, that's cool, you can get to these nine boxes. And you're like, oh, they must have firewalls. But, but then you're getting like returns from local host when you're trying to ping stuff and you're like, that's wicked confusing. <laughs> Maybe my agent's broke. You know, so think about interesting ways to defend like that. But that was seriously one of the hardest things we've ever probably come into. Um, monitoring ports for changes, looking for those types of things, looking at your logs, looking at your configs. There's automated and open source tools to do all of this stuff. Right? These aren't things that we need to bring in the you know, uber crazy you know, leap spent a bunch of money on tools, testers to do this stuff. It's stuff that we can easily find ourselves that we can radically improve the environment with. Um, DNS traffic on the inside, please use split DNS. Just please, please don't let DNS go outside of your environment so that I don't have to listen to all of the people who think that they're awesome. They're like, I use DNS cat and I can get out of anywhere. Like, sorry, you just punched a kid in a wheelchair you're not impressive. <laughs> you know, like it, it, it should be really, really easy to block these types of attacks if we use basic functions of defense. So looking at all of those, taking a look at the configs, restricting access, making sure that we actually wall down networks and we don't rely on VLANs because it's 1996 or whatever people think that VLANs are supposed to do. Um, ridiculous stuff. Workstations are for work.
I knew you'd love that, Keith. This is, this, this is for you. This is a picture of, of, of yeah, this is Keith's office. Um, so if you have a workstation, don't let it do anything but be a workstation. It shouldn't have server functions on it. You know, if you have administration to the workstation, please, God, don't let someone run GPP and Metasploit and dump a whole bunch of clear text passwords out of your GPOs. Like, we know that you took the lazy ass shortcut to send this account to all the machines because you decided you didn't want to have your sysadmin game together and you were like, whatever, I'll just send this account to everybody. Like, remember that every single person who can mount net, you know, sysfall on a domain controller can decrypt all of these passwords. Every single one of your users, no matter what their privileges are. So, like, get that shit out of your GPOs today. Like, if you have to call someone and make them change it, change it right now. It's not hard to fix. All right. Categorization of where they can go do and what they can do. Whitelisting and managing software. Oh, but it's so hard. Our users need so much stuff. It's a workstation. Is it for work? No. Great. You don't get to have it. And if they really, really need it, do the executive thing. Make a process for approval that goes through whatever your role is in the environment, whether it's a manager or whether it's their manager or whether it's the boss or whether it's the VP or whatever other random title somebody gave themselves, and make at least two levels above them sign it. The person above them and the person above that on signing the risk of why you need to have Flash installed in your machine or why you need to have some other arbitrary, you know, like booty net or whatever it is, okay? Don't allow local admin privileges. Again, oh yeah, but we tell everybody that. You tell them that, but they don't fix it. So did you tell them wrong? No, they're, they're, they're idiots. No, you probably just didn't explain why it really needs to happen and what the real impact to risk is. Because a lot of these things don't get fixed because we don't communicate what the real level of risk is. So we have to keep changing our tone until somebody gets it. We have to keep changing the attack structure. We have to keep changing what the pop is at the end to make somebody understand this is why it can't happen. Right? Randomizing all locals and admin passwords. Please don't make it so that I could take a hash and spray it all over the place and log into something else. I mean, Microsoft released laps for that. Go use it. It's not hard to use. Yes, I bitch about this in the Windows world because most of your environments are actually Windows. <gasps> But, but we can fix these types of things really easily. And that's not to say all the LDAP accounts that we have for all the Linux machines that are using it because everybody decided to do it anyway, you can still pass all of it there, right? So randomize the admin passwords. Expect one of your machines to get compromised by a fish, even if we're doing all this other cool stuff. Expect that all of the hashes that happen on that machine are gonna get pulled out of it and they're gonna be used everywhere in your environment. Right? That's, that's step one for what attackers are going to do. And you can have all of your defense stuff in place, but if step one is own the box, take all the hashes on that box and spray them elsewhere, and if you can't see that and you can't defend against that, you have missed step one of your security program. Completely whiffed it. You'd be better off removing the firewalls totally and just letting the whole fucking internet in because you're not doing your job anyway. All right, host-based firewalls, IDS, behavioral analysis, all that stuff you can do, you don't need to spend a million dollars to do it. Just do parts of it. And then, obviously, look for vulnerabilities in the environment. Proactively try and find what the attackers are gonna go after. Doesn't mean you have to fix it, but if I know that we have a bunch of legacy boxes that are Windows XP or embedded systems or all this other stuff, and we found that the vulnerability exists there, we know that we can't fix it. We know that, you know, Dr. A and this thing likes to use his Fox Pro database from the 90s and they're never going to give it up. So let them have it, but then just go write a bunch of rules in all of your detective controls that say, hey, if anything ever goes to this machine that has any of these types of exploits that we know that it's available for, please alert me so that I can go like tell them, hey, you're under attack today, we can't use it right now, but we'll figure it out and let you use it again later. All right, quick ways to do it, obviously, you know, using laps for, and then 
removing any of the GPO stuff, whitelisting, blacklisting services. You know, whitelisting and blacklisting things like, yes, I know I need to, do, I need to use Java. So then at least just whitelist the Java stuff that they need to use. Don't just let them use it anywhere. Right? And, and please don't play the, oh, I'm only going to use signed Java because, I mean, I think Dave has like an option in set where, you know, you click one, then you click two, then you click like four, and then click two again, and, you know, you got around that control. Hardening the devices, hardening anything local, and then obviously making images that can withstand the basics of these types of attacks. Okay, keep on. it's a server, make it serve you. Servers shouldn't have software on them that are not built for serving, period. If you have Office on one of your servers, you fail. <laughs> if you have any Adobe anything on your server, it's a server, not a viewer, not a contenter. It's a server, right? I mean, okay, oh, I have Dreamweaver because it's a web server, Chris, ha, ha, ha. Well, you suck, you have Dreamweaver as a web server. <laughs> Like, do something better. But they don't need to have all of this extra bloatware on them. So we need to remove that from our builds because it's just ways that we can privilege escalate, right? When we hit a server and we get to those boxes and we see that there's non-server services running on it, to us, that's the easiest and quickest way for us to escalate privileges. You know, like the, and there's so many of those that allow like unquoted attacks. Like if you guys done any of that before where if it's, Windows program files slash, um, I don't know, who, who does it by default? Oh, IBM. Um, and like the Tivoli management services, which are now called some other word because people decided to hate on that. But the way it installs, it doesn't quote the actual directory path. And because it doesn't install and quote the directory path, that means as soon as, because Windows reads you know, left to right and does it one character at a time. If you make something called program.exe, and put it in that path, it will run program exe because it says run this thing. It forgets the space and it goes, oh, run program exe, cool. And now you get to run it with elevated privileges. Super easy privilege escalation in Windows. And people are like, what? Because we forgot to put the quotes in the installer? Well, yeah, that's because your vendors didn't give a shit about security in that. But test those things, make sure that they work. We can test that stuff with our default image and go, we know the default image isn't vulnerable to that. Um, there's some great scripts out there like the, the pen test monkey scripts that, uh, that have a bunch of Windows escalation privilege checks as well as the one for Linux. All right, so if you're doing this stuff, remove everything right away, start leaning down your servers, they're gonna run better, they're gonna actually perform well, and they're not gonna have all of these ancillary attacks that we can elevate privilege through. If you can't get anything on the box, on the really, really important ones, try using stuff like OSEC or any of the other free services that exist out there, the open source services, to at least get some visibility on the box to see how you might be able to deploy it. You don't have to deploy all these things in a big way. You can deploy it with one feature on and start to try and grow it and change it over time. Right? Deploy it on a default image with it not running and just doing some analysis so that at the end of the day, if you really needed to get into the box, instead of having to install this stuff, you could go over to the box, turn it on, and say, hey, look, you're part of a new IR gig that I'm in. Now I want you to start logging some things without us having to change everything on the box and alert the attacker that we're putting logging tools on the thing. All right? This all seem common, basic. And I say all this stuff as basic as it seems because it really, really works. When people do this stuff and we're pen testing their environment, it's crazy hard. Like very often I get to the point of wanting to grab my backpack, pull out my 40 cal and just put it in somebody's mouth and be like, log in. Log into the network, walk me into the server room. I want to be done with this job. I'm sick of working all day and all night. Just go log in. Like if we can aggravate the testers to that point, we're doing our job. Okay? Yes? No? Cool. I don't know what the hell that is. That just randomly... <laughs> hey, look, it's a table with things. All right. Correlation. So we talked some about that, pulling in different correlating points. There's lots of ways that we can correlate in environments that don't cost big, giant, expensive gobs of money. You can spend them if you have a ton of money to spend on toys 
but I'd say just start small. Because if you can start small in some of these things and have the project space where you can say, all right, I'm gonna carve out trying this new defensive technique and see what the open source tools give you, at least you have a reference point for when the big guys come in and they go, it's $5 million to deploy this across the whole environment. And you're like, oh, that's cool. I could do that with Bro with like seven clicks. <laughs> How do you beat Bro with me clicking a couple times? Show me, start there and then tell me where you add value for $5 million more. So using IDS and IPS to report, setting up Onion and Bro is really easy. Use it in a small way. You can deploy it much larger, much more scalable. There's people that are giving talks about stuff like that. Um, using Splunk, Splunk is great. Splunk is free-ish, uh, but it really isn't free. We all know that. That's why when they IPO, people made like $700 million, because it's not free. <laughs> um, Setting up an elk stack is free. And setting up an elk stack, yes, you have to learn how Elastic Search works. Oh my God, you're gonna have to read a book for a little bit, but there's YouTube videos, you can click your way through it. And if you use Elastic Search with Logstash and Kibana, you will have Magic Splunk. You will have I built it myself Magic Splunk and then you can start doing cool stuff like putting in open IOC, putting in taxi, putting in all sorts of the other items that are out there where you can pull in MD5s from all of the most latest, greatest, cool badware that's on earth and search everything that's in your stack and logs and go, oh, hey, look, I see this MD5 flying around. I don't know why. You don't even have to know where it came from. But if it comes from a match between one of your input rule sets that's external in one of your internal rule sets, you know that it's something to go look at. So you at least are starting on the basics of it, right? Um, looking at multiple sources, Skilly, really, really great because you can correlate from multi-sources. So there's a whole big input now to using that and Bro and some other things together where you can literally click on the threat intel feeds and you can become, oh, fuck, I said it. Yeah, well, you can become bioactive. You can just click all the intel feeds and put them together and then sell them to people for like millions of dollars without doing any research. Um, Haha, <laughs> it's true. Um, that sucks, but it's true. So please, do it yourself, right? Uh, the, anybody look at the cool stuff that the FireEye guys have been doing on the open source side with Flare? Anyone ever heard of it? All right. So Flare did some really good stuff, and, and I really appreciate what they started looking at because I try and go to all of these conferences to find how do I get to the next point where I get stuck on a pen test? What do I have to use to go farther, right? Oh, this got caught. Oh, this got caught. This technique got caught. No, I don't want to burn my custom C2, so I need to find somebody else's C2 that's public-ish in order for me to keep going further because these people are doing a really good job at defense. Um, so now all of these people are in the PowerShell world of hotness, right? Everybody knows that PowerShell is the new, next new cool hot thing to do in Windows, right? Well, PowerShell is awesome. And once they got a little bit more past the how do we use PowerShell, the real mechanism for PowerShell to interact with Windows is WMI. Right? Windows instrumentation works across everything. It's really cool because it's actually the most functional logging piece of all of Windows. Right? You can find anything that's going on in the environment. Like System Event Viewer, shittiest logging ever. Right? You can barely tell what, I mean, it's the most cryptic, like, hey, here's a log error, see more details. X009996 B9990001-65. What's that? Don't know. Is there a link? Nah. What do you have to do? Go search for it. So now you have people who are on like a domain controller who are like, oh, well, my domain controller needs access to the internet. Why? Well, because I have no idea what this shit means and I need to be able to copy it and paste it. That's legitimately why people are like, that's why my DC needs to get to the internet because the event viewer is so crappy that I don't even know what it is. But WMI has this beautifully rich system for logging all of this stuff. So when I was looking at PowerShell commands and I was looking at all of the different instrumentation that was out there for really amazing projects, like if anybody has looked at all the like, stuff that the PowerSploit guys are doing um, and the, the shell framework that they made called Empire, 
which is just amazing. So they made all this really awesome stuff to be the, you know, kind of replacement or augmentation for Metasploit in a lot of ways when it wasn't being able to see to the right way or other people had tuned their environments just to get ready for Metasploit so they're like, oh, I caught your interpreter thing. So now they use Empire instead. But you can look for these basic seven things in Windows implementation and you will find the bulk of persistence mechanisms that exist in today's conventional attack tools, right? Looking for event filters, event consumers, and filter consumers anytime that they're created, that means somebody's making something that's persistent on the machine. Instances of namespace and being able to direct traffic show that somebody's giving you C2. You know, if you have any type of class creation event, you know that there's a store for the data that's been classed. You know, looking at any of the other providers, so anytime a new provider comes into play, you get an alert on that. There's nothing that should be doing those things. There's nothing that should be using those provider engaged services. So I put, um, I don't even think I have a link to it because I did it on the airplane. Um, if you look on my GitHub, I put like a couple quick PowerShell scripts for how to find these things. And I'm the most ghetto shitty programmer in the world. So like it writes it to a text file. <laughs> just so that you can get the concept of where it goes. But if you take any of this stuff and it writes to a text file and you run it, start playing with some of these other frameworks and playing with PowerShell, like installing Meterpreter over PowerShell or using Empire or using PowerSploit or any of these things. If you see that and it writes something to the text file, it's an instant alert that somebody's doing bad stuff in PowerShell or bad stuff in WMI. So the stuff that they were doing with Flare, which you'll see the little link, is they were making an IDS that's hostless, host, you know, there's no program that's on it. It's just code written in order for WMI to log things that happen in WMI and send them out to something else. So you can send them out into your Windows event log, use that in your SEM to start trapping the stuff. So really check that stuff out because the, the attacker attackers, I mean, I know I always use China just because they attack me all the time. Um, so fuck you, I can attack you back. Well, at least I think so. Um, <laughs> right? I'm like, it's not CN, it's my network. <laughs> but, but they're really, really into using PowerShell and WMI. Most of their APT teams use these types of attacks. So we need to make sure that we have something in line to defend or, or monitor that. Okay. So that's the basic stuff. <laughs> IR game. Getting your IR game in order is really hard because most people don't have the ability to really truly get a full incident response process. A lot of times it's just one of us who is also the security person or it's one of us who's also the network person, the server person and the security person doing all of these things at the same time. So getting IR is hard because you don't really have a team to work with. So making sure that we have some type of human understanding of what the team is and moving these people towards a program where it's like, you get the executives and everybody else to understand this is like DR. I'm gonna make a big book, and we're gonna have all these cool little Visio diagram things to say, you know, if monkey finds blinky light on computer, go to this. And then if blinky light does this thing, go to this. And if blinky light gets analyzed as bad things, then go to this. And, and just, just starting incident response in that way is really, really helpful, right? Things that you can do to build the IR team. Lenny has a great practice in his website of how to build a strength in IR. Everything from tools to flowcharts to what things you can use to why you're going to use them. And a good methodology on how to take some type of attack, whether it's a virus or whether it's a shell, or whether it's somebody running exploits against something, and make a good step-by-step -step method of how to investigate those things so that you're not just playing the game of, oh, just re-image it. So we have clients all the time that play the game of like, oh, we found you. You found us. Yes, we found you. Okay. What'd you do? Well, we went to the machine, we pulled it off the network. Good. And then we re-imaged it. Okay. And then we put it back on the network and now they're working again. Be like, so you didn't stop anything. They're like, well, yeah, we re the machine. 
I'm like, okay, well, what about all the creds on the machine that I was able to harvest? And they're like, what creds? Like, well, you're supposed to know that, you're doing IR. And they're like, well, tell me what creds you got. I'm like, no, you go find what creds I got. So teaching the IR people to use frameworks, use Metasploit, use Core, use any of these things to go in, teach them why you need to dump hashes, why you need to dump all the cookies of the web sessions, why you need to teach them how to look at live SSP and everything that comes out and Mimikatz, being able to get an idea of what tokens on their box and go, hey, after you did IR, when you do this, you need to collect what are the collateral damages pieces that this server actually brings to us. And then from all these collateral damage pieces, I need to know to shut those down and to continue on the machine, right? So we need to do that. Building a response platform, there's a couple that are out there. GER's great for that. You know, the, there's CrowdSpawns from CrowdStrike that's trying to do it. There's, you know, all of the like Schneier, it's a billion dollars to do it tools. Um, myself, I, I, I use RTIR and MediaWiki. I know we're ghetto. But RTIR is great. You have your, your awesome Dutch that have put together some things in the, in the Swedish who put together some awesome tools to make ticketing for incident response, make it a ticketing system, and then make sure that your ticketing system is constantly feeding education back to the environment. So we use that in combination with the media wiki so that we can say anytime we found this attack, we found these types of collateral damage, we know these types of attack works, we know how we can manipulate attacks in a different way and make them stronger. We know how to defend them in a different way, and that actually gives you a repo of information versus, oh yeah, the incident's gone, we re-image the box, click next. Make sense? And I know that some of this stuff is boring, but man, if people actually do these things, when they do these things, my life totally sucks. It is the shittiest, most horrible thing when people implement even a tenth of these things and you really have to work for it. So if you can take something maybe out of one of each one of these areas and try and implement it or try and suggest those types of things to implement to the customer. I mean, I, I know women, I talked about this yesterday. People don't like making good suggestions when you're on the offense side because they think it's going to put them out of a job. That's sad. We should be good enough to know that we can take all of these suggestions and go, cool, now that you have a really hardened environment, instead of doing this pen test for a week, I'm going to spend two months. Because I know that a week's not going to get us there. Or maybe over time it's going to go, like we have clients that have went from a week to a month to a year to five years. Yes, pen test that's still going on for the third year of five years. Have we gotten anywhere? Kind of. Did we get what we want yet? Not even close. Will we? Fuck yeah. <laughs> but it's just going to take time. Okay. That's it. I don't have much more. If you guys have questions, anything else? Is it worthwhile to at least go over some of the basics? Yeah. Well, just the last thing you said uh, was uh, I guess that are going on for five years. Sorry, uh, could, could you? The thing I was uh, wondering, uh, the last thing you said was uh, that pen tests may be going on uh, like for a third year in a row. I just wonder how you can uh, remain motivated for that long a time because as a developer, for example, you know that the thing that keeps you going and uh, driven is that you keep seeing new results also in our security line of work, I guess. But if you're on the third year, I think you, I probably would have lost all focus and dedication to even continue on that project. It would be killing. Can you? It's, like, it's like being interested in your child. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're not just if like, your child is you're not like, hey, you're three. <laughs> you're really kind of bored with you. Right? Okay, like you, have to, you have to monitor those things. So like when, when you're doing these like real, real big tests like that, our job to start off the first six months to a year is much more about setting up the systems that are going to give us the ability to get 
the things that we need when we need them. So monitoring the environment, monitoring how ports change in the environment, what servers go online and offline, start defining what their process is for building servers, setting up all of our automated OSINT pieces so that we're constantly monitoring every single thing that they put to the internet. Every document gets anim metadata analyzed, every time something's open, anytime there's a press release, anytime, and, and what we start to see uh, like in this one specifically, which I'm sure they'll listen to, they listen to all my talks because they're trying to like figure out like where's he going next? Um, so I can give them a piece of that for this, right? Um, a year ago, there was a press release that they bought a new company. They, they absorbed the company. So instantly I was like, yeah, sweet. So we go in, we attacked the shit out of it. Like it's the day the press release came out, we owned every single thing in that company. And then we were just sitting there waiting and we're waiting for addresses that we know from their internal network to start the Borg, right? Like, and the Borg starts taking over parts of their network, and we start getting logins from some of their machines. We see their AD starting to get tied together. We're like, cool, we'll just kind of hang back over here. We're not, like, we're not gonna be in this, because they, the way that they do it is really smart. They do system analysis before they bring things in. They bring them in one service at a time. Um, so we had to start stubbing executables to know that they were gonna run this executable to analyze what it does and who it calls home to. So we had to make you know, kits that weren't non-interactive and, and stuff like that. So it's a hard game to play, but it's really, really exciting and really rewarding because you can have a couple of them going on and the second I get a text message or an email from one of our systems that's like, hey, there's a new thing online and it has a shitty version of Drupal, I'm like, yeah, can I hold on and talk to you for one second? And I'm like, has somebody popped that yet? And like, then it's hitting everybody on our team and they're like, oh yeah, we're all in. Like, by the time that I get to my computer sometimes, they've now made it to the next level of challenge that we're trying to get to and we're retuning all of our systems that are watching for everything to see what the next opportunity is. So it's not like you're sitting there staring at a screen for three years, right? You set up your automation, you set up your systems and you wait for the good shit to come. And then it's fun, it's like Christmas every time you get an email. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah? Oh, well, sorry, I don't know if I didn't, I didn't look anywhere else. No, thanks. Shit. So, if I could summarize your thesis in like 140 characters, it's basically do the fundamentals of IT well, and um, you, one, and two, you may achieve much better results using open source security tools than Stop. big fancy Stop. boxes. Stop, you hit 140 characters. Yeah, sorry. Next tweet is? Nah. <laughs> so the critical, I'm sold on that. But people, finding qualified people who care is a challenge. Um, I have such a long talk about that. So can you say something about what the culture is like in the teams that do these things that fuck with your game? Because, well, that's my question. What's the, what yeah. do they do right in the culture? The, the thing that I've found through the, the multiple iterations of testing like this is that they are not people that are afraid of the fight because they got into the fight once and realized that they survived. And then after they got into the fight and realized that they survived, they figured out the next time that they survived better and more efficiently and more effectively by working together. And by the fourth, the fifth, the sixth year of doing stuff like this, they're the ones that are talking shit. They're the ones that in the shell are like, ha ha, I got you, picking up the phone. I mean, one of my favorite stories of any of that is I had a CISO call me and say, hey, my guys are in the office this weekend, freaking out, patching stuff, standing up all these honeypots and services and all this other stuff. And I'm like, why? Did, did something happen? They were like, yeah. So they saw that Chris Gates was looking for a restaurant in our city. And they just figured you guys were out testing us, so they're losing their shit and like battening the whole environment down. And I was like, that's awesome. And I was like, I think he's there with his family on vacation. He's like, yeah, I'm not gonna tell him. <laughs> that type of stuff, where, where I have blue teamers that are on the phone and they're like, really dude, this weak ass jar? Like, I'm like, you, you, you signed it with a Microsoft cert? Like, come on, man. And I'm like, I'm literally at dinner. Like, I'm at dinner, it's not me. And they're like, we know it's you. And still, still not me. You know, the people who take the adversary game and use it as something that ignites them and makes them interested in their job and not like, oh, we got hacked, quick, get on LinkedIn and put my resume out. You know, like if, 
if you're really a defender, then you get fired up about the fight. You love it. You like that's what you want to do. You want people to come attack. And so so really the 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 biggest thing that I find in any of those teams is the people that welcome the offense and want it. And they want to see the offense, they want to see how it works, and they want to make fun of those guys. They want to stomp bad attackers. So, Thanks. all right, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. I'm happy to chat about any of this stuff the rest of the time I'm here. So, thank you.